So I was saying that we are very glad to have with us today Yorgos Lukas. is uh, in a way a remote member of, uh, <laughs> of our research center, spent so many years with that. And that's why I say that literally he is a member of our center with, with collaborations, uh, etc. And uh, as you also, most of you know, since many years now, he's uh, at another uh, astronomical institute of an academy of uh, the uh, Academy of Prague, Czech, Czech Academy, Czech academy of, of, of Science, it's located in Prague. And uh, Joros uh, is working in dynamics, but in uh, dynamics that involve relativity and uh, um, non-classical, let's say, this is a general term, uh, approximation of dynamics, like particles uh, close to black holes and all that stuff. And uh, we have heard several seminars in the past in this line of research. And uh, along this line is also the today's talk, the center of mass issue of an extended body moving in a curved space-time. Okay, thank you, Manos, for the introduction. It's happy always, I'm happy always to be back. And it's a pleasure to be here again. So uh, the issue is the following. Usually when we address uh, some dynamical system, as Pano said, and in the particular case, uh, we have black holes in general, but it can be also a neutron star or a, a main sequence star. We address them as point particles. We say we ignore all the quadruples or the multiple structure and say, okay, I have a point here, I have a point there. There is some interaction, Newtonian uh, forces, or uh, you have geodesic in general relativity. And in general, you ignore the structure of the body. So the talk uh, it's, today is about what's going on when you say, okay, this body is not a point. It's actually a star, so it has a volume. It has some multiple structure. And in this case, we address the issue in the case of relativity. So we have some curved space time to simplify the terminology. Let me say that it's just a black hole. I don't know how many of you know the terminology of care, but it's care black hole. So uh, we have a certain space time and an extended movie and an extended body is moving in the background of this black hole. So this is a very old story and uh, I will address it in two ways. One is theoretical, which I enjoy personally, striking equations on a board that you cannot usually do today and you have analytical expressions that you can work on with the help of mathematics or other tools, but in general, it has this analytical path. And then you have also some numerics to help you to figure out the whole situation and give you some results that are uh, useful for, uh, let's say, in this case, for a gravitational wave detection in the future by a certain detector called uh, laser interferometer space antenna, or short LISA. So this is the introduction, some motivation, some further motivation. So when we have uh, the Newtonian, let's say, the flat space time, we can say this is the body. We find the center of the mass. And okay, it depends on the uh, on the when we have, for example, the sun and our planet. Our planet can be approximated by a point, and if you shift the point and you do the uh, correct, uh, let's say, uh, changes in the uh, when you change the center of the mass, everything is fine. But this is not maybe the case in the case of the curved space time, and also there is an issue how we can define a reference point of this extended body. So this is not trivial. I will show that this is a almost 100 years old story. 
it started almost 20 years after uh, Einstein introduced general relativity and people, uh, people said, okay, as I said, we don't have only points, we have extended bodies, we have to describe them so somehow in uh, the general relativistic framework. And uh, then there is the question that I said, uh, so we choose some reference points inside the body and the main question, okay, you choose some reference point that you say, okay, I'm describing by this reference point, the whole body or this, and I assign to this uh, point a mass. Are these uh, points describing the same body? In other uh, words, is this gauge choice? So if I'm an observer far uh, further away from the system, I'm measuring, for example, the frequency, which is, uh, is variant from the observer point of view in uh, the general realistic uh, framework. Do I measure the same frequency? Or by changing the reference point, does the uh, frequency change? And uh, this, the final part is the application that I talk about this. There is, you can have some small discrepancies because always you have some system and you try to approximate it in some kind of framework, but small discrepancies you can sometimes ignore because, for example, if you want to measure this, you don't need to know uh, the uh, the measurement of this body up to nanometers. Uh, it's enough you take a usual meter and said, okay, this table is up to a millimeter accuracy, but if you have gravitational waves and you have these effects, can these effects, even if they are small enough, have an accumulative uh, effect on the wall observation? In order to be, to be uh, specific. In LIGO now, LIGO Virgo is observing terrest uh, the terrestrial observatories are observing uh, black holes which are emerging after a few cycles. So not the, the what we observe is few cycles to be precise. But in the future, Lisa, I will show it uh, later with uh, a, a plot, will observe many cycles. So if you have small discrepancies that you say, okay, 10 cycles, nothing. But if you go to 1,000 cycles, to 10,000 cycles, 100,000 cycles, and you have small discrepancies, these things can accumulate, and then they can have an impact. And this is the question that I want to address. If some things that we will find theoretically, if we apply it in uh, the gravitational wave uh, analysis, will have any, uh, let's say, uh, meaningful impact. I must say that this, this project is something that started when I left from uh, the Academy of, uh, of from RCIM. I went to Germany, the professor uh, there told me, okay, there is the problem, solve it. I'm still solving it 14 years later. So, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so there will be places that will also comment that I'm working on the almost, almost 20 years. So, uh, I'm not, with that, what I'm trying to say, I won't give you probably the answer to all of this question, but I will give you some intuition and some hints, okay? So, uh, as you see, Matheson in 1937 said, okay, how I can address this problem? I have an extended body moving in some black holes, uh, or black holes, that they have in the black holes, some curved space time, general relativistic framework. What I should do? First of all, I will ignore that the body is actually the, the secondary body, so I have a black, uh, black hole or whatever, and the secondary body is deforming the background. So it's a test body. Somebody that has certain mass, some multiple structure, but I'm ignoring how this body is deforming the space time it's, uh, itself. And then I will take the stress energy tensor 
I don't know if you're familiar with this terminology, but the stress energy tensor is basically uh, some quantity that is describing certain uh, 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 certain qualities and quantities of the body. So if it's deformed or what is the mass of it, what's the uh, uh, energy density, the pressure, etc. And what I do, I find a point in this body, which is not a trivial task, and then uh, I expand around this point, this uh, stress and energy tensor. At zero order, I have the most uh, the mass monopole, which is the, what we will call the classical mechanics momentum. Then I have a dipole, which I will use a simple it's spin, it's how the body spins. And then I have second order, which is the quadruple, so tidal forces, etc. And the list goes on. And what I do, I find a reference point uh, that evolves with time. The time, this is some affine parameter for simplicity uh, imagined as time, and evolves. Uh, along a certain uh, word line. And this has a certain a volume, this body, so it creates a, around it a, a certain uh, word view, as we call it. And now I have what the usual thing about this red uh, vector will be the four velocity. And then I have a certain vector that uh, this is what I choose when I choose the uh, center of mass is chosen with respect to that. And I create foliations, uh, uh, space-like hypersurfaces that are perpendicular to this uh, four vector. So, this is a 3D animation uh, depiction, but you could imagine that it's actually not even 4, yeah, it's 4D, it should be, but it's possible to do it. So this is the time, and then you have the space in different directions. And these cuts are where I defined uh, my, uh, um, the, 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 my extended body. You can see it. This is the, these are the cuts, which are perpendicular to the four velocity. So this is the general recipe. And if we translate it to equations, it looks like that. This is called the covariant derivative. It's something more uh, complicated than usual time derivative. Then you have the Riemann tensor which is expressing the curvature of the space-time. So uh, how the space-time is deformed, you have the four velocity, the spin we have introduced, and you have now the quadrupole term. And below you have the dipole, and you will see that if you ignore the curvature, so away, far away from the center uh, of the, of the gravity, let's say we have a black hole away. You can even ignore these things, and you will see that you have the usual geodesic. But in this case, if we don't ignore the curvature, then all these stuff appear. And you have, uh, and the dependence, you will see that the dependence of the evolution of the quadrupole uh, term you don't have an equation of motion. So you have to assign by yourself. You have to find the physics. You will see black holes, neutron stars, how they are defined as certain setups, and then uh, try to tackle them because the equation themselves don't include them. They include only the monopole and the dipole. So the most people concentrate on the pole dipole approximation, as we say. And then you have some equation that couple the vector as said, this uh, perpendicular to the hypersurfaces that we have defined before with the, uh, with the spin uh, tensor. 
And uh, this fixes the center of the mass of so the center around which we expand our body. So, a simplified version of the ball situation. If we have a flat space time and we have a rotating body that's rotating uh, along this, and we have different observers. One is not moving at all with respect of the body, which is rotating. Then we have some with uh, some velocity and with greater velocity. Then we will see that the center of the mass, because of a, sp a special relativity, will shift. So it will shift towards uh, this edge because of the different velocities of the points in the body. So this is, you can imagine this as the use that we use. So in order to have some schematic understanding of what's going on. And uh, this body cannot be super luminous. So it has, a, uh, it, uh, it's, there is a minimal radius, which is what we write there, the molar radius. At, it, at which the body has to extend in order not to be superluminous. And this uh, is the maximal uh, radius that we can have different uh, center of masses. Three dimensional body. It's a three dimensional body. It's just a, a sphere. But in this case, it can be even this. It doesn't matter. It's just a schematic in order to get an understanding of what's going on. So the whole story is about having different set of masses and trying to find, uh, let's say, if in, in the, when I have a curved space time and I have a black hole, that I can ignore the curvature of the space time if these shifts matter in our observations at the end. So there are different choices of space supplementary conditions. This is uh, the only one that defines uniquely the center of mass is this. And the others are actually families, which means that you have, even if you have one relation, you can have, with, uh, you have to introduce extra constraints in order to get the center of the mass. And you have, you can find it in uh, gravitation. There are certain rules that these uh, space abelian conditions can communicate be between, uh, between each other. And uh, we'll see an example in flat space time, but before we go to that, there is a funny question. As a theoretician, you can ask funny question and say, okay, I have an extended body that has certain uh, structure. Can it follow geodesic? So uh, geodesic is the simplest uh, orbit in, uh, in uh, curved space times. So uh, we have a uh, look at this with some collaborators and we have found that yes, there are, and this is the care of the equatorial plane because if you go Earth equatorial, it's totally madness, you cannot constrain it. And there is a certain relation. And at this, when this happens, all the spin secondary conditions, so the different set of masses we, uh, we examined, coincide. So, and they are at the same point with the, if we didn't have even spin. And in this case, actually, the spin is uh, drifted along the geodesic uh, orbit. And here you have radial motion in Schwarzschild. So you shoot directly to the black hole, the central black hole. In this case, you have a special relation. This is the Kerr parameter, is how the, uh, the central black hole is spinning. And this is the energy of the test body. And this is its angular momentum. So this is a funny treatment that you can do if you're a theoretical physicist. And it has no, I don't know if it has any application actually, but it's fun to do it to see if things happen. And then you have something uh, that uh, is like 
uh, let's say, one of the conditions have a funny behavior. It's like the Ptolemaic system. If you don't, don't take the, uh, the center of the solar system as uh, being as the focus or the center, of other, is the center of the sun, and you say the center of our system is uh, the Earth, then you get an extra unnecessary epicycle motion. And this is somehow the same thing. So there is a special special condition, you don't care about it. And then you get this for different velocities. So remember, we have different velocities in schematic. This is 0 0.5 with respect to the speed of light, 0 0.9 with respect to the speed of light. And then you have some initial conditions and you want to see how it evolves. So the orbit starts here and we have shifted the orbit here and here. And what you want to see, if they are equivalent, that the phases, this epicyclic motion will stay in tune. If it won't stay in tune, then the whole thing is not working correctly. This is not a just gauge choice. And in the flat space time, there is no problem. So, as you see, you can progress. This C is just evolving the uh, whole evolution in time. Nothing changes. Everything stays in tune. But if you go to the curved space time, as is the Schwarz, and you do the same trip, I don't know if this is visible. It's starting in tune. And as you progress, it's detuning. You can see it at the end. as the cycle closes. And now you can wonder, is the numerical trick, is it something that I did wrong? Let's do it analytically. And we have done it with, uh, maybe it's your generation, Yasunas Timoyanis, who was part of his master and then PhD thesis. And what we did, we said, okay, we have the frequencies. We can find it analytically with a certain way. And we expand them as a power series in terms of sigma, which is the measure of the spin. And then we see how it's the agreement. So a zero order, which, which is basically the, we don't have any contribution from the spin. If you switch off the Kerr parameter, it's basically Kepler's law, okay? The frequency is three half with the, with the radius. So it's Kepler's law. This is a general relativistic correction because you have a Kerr uh, black hole in the center. In the first line, when we go to the first order, everything is the same. And then things start to change. So the Tulci of Dixon, a certain family from the maths of Pirani, which is not having this funny motion, this helical motion, which is some epicyclic motion, they are in agreement. But this disagrees. And all the other terms are disagreeing. So what we said, you can have certain laws, how you can shift the things. So what we did, that's OK. This is fine. We expected it. There are different centroids. We should use the law to make the shifts. So what we did is we used the shift in the, in the rad, uh, radial distance. And then what happened is that we have agreement up to third order. This is circular motion around uh, a kind of black hole. And this corrected, this started to agree with this uh, choice of uh, center of mass up to second order. Great. So if we applied higher uh, order correction, it seems that everything should be OK. So we did that. If I don't want to show you the so there is a spin corrections, there are centroid corrections of higher order. But what we saw that even we introduced the correct corrections that we should do when we split between the center of masses, nothing happens. We cannot improve the, the uh, let's say, 
the agreement between the frequencies for different sets of mass, which is telling us that uh, uh, the pole dipole approximation, the center of mass is not a gauge choice. Or you can say equivalently, the Matheson Papa Petro Dixon equation don't hold. But usually you don't care about this is the theoretical, let's say, aspiration of a uh, of this whole thing. But if you look at it realistically, Lisa won't care beyond this term. And if you have agreement in this order, everything is fine. So from orbital point of view, this result says for the accuracy that Lisa measures gravitational waves, this should not matter. But this is just the dynamical part. This is the orbital part. One should see what happens at the level of a radiation reaction. And one of the other funny things, when you have analytical expression, you can new find new ways of finding analytical things. So I don't know if you're familiar with the in, uh, inner stable circular orbit. Uh, basically, uh, I don't know. If you have an effective potential for a black hole, then you have one, this is R, then you have one stable orbit. One unstable orbit. And for certain choices of radius, energy, angular momentum, this becomes the same. And you have an ISPO, mm -hmm. which in dynamical term is differently stable uh, circular orbit. Why it's interesting? Because uh, when we have an accretion disk, according to the textbook theory, the care parameter, the spin of the black hole, is measured uh, when you see uh, um, we find the ISO. So when you have the black hole, the accretion disk is assumed to end at ISCO radius. And since you know the ISCO, the ISCO depends on the spin of the black hole, so you can deduce the black hole. And since we have found this is not for geodesics from, I don't know when, but for the case of the spinning body, this is uh, something that uh, goes, okay, 50 years ago, but the for all the, let's say, special conditions, only uh, quite recent developments in the last decade. When you measure in hundreds, then decades, are very recent. So this is pole dipole. Let's introduce quadrupole. Why we introduce higher order when we see the discrepancy in pole dipole? Because you say, okay, if you have, even in, uh, if you have uh, Newtonian forces and you forget about the tidal forces, then you don't expect the, uh, the body to understand. So the higher, if you ignore the higher multiples, you don't expect the body to, uh, to behave correctly. Because if, I'm, uh, my, if I have a center, of, uh, a center of mass there, a force that's dragging me there, this hand is feeling stronger force than this hand. This also with the curvature. So this is a tidal force, basically. And if we ignore the quadrupole terms, we're ignoring the tidal forces in this approximation. So the whole idea is, hey, if I introduce more and more multiples to this structure, I should be able to correct the whole thing. And this is only a part. So we take into account just the deformation of the body because of the spin, not because of the curvature itself, or if you of the Newtonian field, if you want to have the analogy with the 
uh, Newtonian uh, mechanics. So here you have what you tell. This is the only physical quantity that you should uh, care about. This is uh, this has been found for a center for a certain uh, space abandoned condition, which is called Kluge addiction. That for when it's one, we describe a black hole. When it's before, before uh, between four and six, it's a neutral star. So we try to introduce this into our scheme and look again at circular uh, motion around black holes. And uh, what we found is that instead of having agreement, we have actual disagreement. You can see even uh, the change. So this is second order. Uh, this is, uh, if you expand the frequency, this is uh, spin square. You have changes in the uh, kila, uh, yeah, in the curvature of the of the graph. But we have ignored all the other terms. What we should introduce uh, the tidal deformation. There are other. So one, it might be because of that. Two. It might be because when we change the space of the condition, nobody has told us, nobody has uh, actually said what will be these values. And this might be the source of the difference because in a work uh, almost 10 years ago, there was, it's not explicitly said, but there are some implications that is showing that when you change the space of the condition, this equation of state uh, quantity changes as well. But nobody has looked at, at the moment. So this is another open question. Uh, so let's go to- The internal structure of the body is not yeah. homogeneous in the structures inside the world. The, so if you have neutral star, it has different, it's, uh, you have to have, have an equation of state. Okay. And therefore you have this four, four to six span for the neutral star. This is somehow expressing these differences, the different choices of equation of state. So no, for a black hole. No, no, that it's an internal structure in the body in the sense that it has uh, some voids or some, uh, no, no, no. It, it, it has, in neutral stars we have, you have, Quark uh, gluon plasma. Yes. Then you have, as you go away from the center, the equation of state and the the, 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 the fluid changes. In the black hole is more simple. Therefore, you have one number, and this is it. So, what we are looking as uh, as a group in Prague is the extreme mass ratio is parallel. I will describe them later on. But since I have the figure here, you have a supermassive black hole, and then you have a stellar black hole or a neutron star orbiting around uh, the central black hole. And if you are, I don't know, 100 uh, uh, Schwarzer radi away, in the case of Sagratarius A, the center of the galaxy it will be something like. Uh, let's say the order of one astronomical unit because the black hole of the central is 0 0.1 astronomical unit plus minus 0 0.0.8, but these are details. So if you are of this order, then you will see the gravitational wave taking over and due to radiation reaction is losing energy angular momentum and the bodies is spiraling inside the central body. And this is very slow uh, process. It can last for years. And as it loses energy and angular momentum, it's also deforming the space and this is a strain. So what is the strain? If I have a gravitational wave, it has a certain amplitude. And this amplitude is actually how the space time is waving. So we have a system that's emitting them and these waves are coming to us. And this is something that we uh, that we detect. If I can say it in a schematic way, because this is a diverse. Uh, so I'm here, Mirella is there, 
So this is the delta, uh, so this is our distance. The, the way that the distance changes as the gravitational wave passes divided by our distance is basically the strain, okay? So these are very small quantities. These deformations, we don't see our distance changes uh, to change, uh, doesn't change. So, uh, but the gravitational wave detectors will be able to take them. And you can see the, I don't know if this is readable. So you have the lag of Virgo, you have another plan for Japan, the Seagull, gravitational wave detector, you have Lisa here, and each of them have different sources. And basically, I cannot remove your screen sharing probably. Let's see if this moves more. Right, panel, what will happen? No remains. Move it up. Move it up. Okay. So these are these are the frequencies. So we start from hertz, we go to millihertz, and these are nanohertz. At, at uh, the, gra uh, the gra gravitational wave observatories, the terrestrial ones are able to operate above Hertz because of the seismic uh, uh, activity of Earth. Therefore, we need space borne or space based uh, gravitational wave detectors in order to be able to detect something that is below Hertz. And the masses, as we go to this side, increase. So here we have stellar mass, black holes or neutral stars. Here we have something that goes 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. Here is 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. And here you go, something goes to 10 to the 9. So as you go along this line, you could imagine also the masses of the object that you observe to increase. And here you have all the things that will be observed by, or supposed to be observed by Lisa, which are supermassive black hole mergers, will have so many uh, uh, white wolves binaries that actually they will be stochastic noise and preventing us from having good detections of certain sort of they are some noise, they will introduce some noise. And you have extreme mass ratio spirals. And actually, the most challenging things to detect will be the extreme mass ratio spirals because they live at the bottom of the sensitivity curve. So this is showing up to which level we will be able to detect. And the extreme mass ratio spirals actually live at the bottom of this bar. And we will have them simultaneously. So all the signals from the supermass black hole mergers, the white walls, neutron stars, whatever we see in the sky in a certain distance, will be sending us simultaneously signals. So today we have the uh, with terrestrial uh, body, uh, observatories, we have the, the current problem is, okay, we have some noise, and we want to get the signal from the noise. Here, the problem is we will have too many signals at the same time, and we want to detect them all. And there are different strategies. So detect first the most heavy ones, which are supermassive. Then whatever remains, get the stronger one. I don't know, uh, black hole binaries from our galaxy or nearby galaxies. And then whatever is left should be for extreme mass ratio spirals. Or create a global template, which means that you introduce everything inside. And this template that I am talking about is this thing. So we, in order to detect uh, gravitational waves, what you have to do you have to create these wavy forms, what we call templates, and you have to match them with your signal, which is called match filtering. If you imagine it's like Fourier, you have a series, you choose different frequencies, and when you get the correct one, you have a peak. Here is more complicated, but the schematic, the principle is the same. You have different uh, templates, you pass them through the signal, 
and through uh, Bayesian statistics, you get the correct answer or the probably most correct answer. So this will be the problem with uh, the detection of extreme mass ratio. They are at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. And the other problem that we have is that uh, we need to have a certain accuracy. And the, as I said before, if I want to measure a table, I can use a usual uh, meter. I don't need to go to nanometers. And this is the same question that is posed here. We have something that we call phase. So this is the waving that you see in the, uh, in the previous uh, plot. And if you have 10 cycles, a small discrepancy, you don't care. Because a very small, as I would say, something that's relatively 10 to minus 6 with 1, and you take 10 times 10 to minus 6, who cares? But if you have 10 of 1,000 cycles, this will become 1. And then it will be uh, it will be uh, affecting your measurements, and this is a game that is played here. So the, when we uh, when we have the correction in the center of the mass, this this shouldn't uh, enter here, and this is the the main driver. So if you open Wikipedia and you say gravitational waves. Probably you will get something that is of this order. This is adiabatic. So the main driver that drives the dissip uh, what we call the average dissipative first order cell force. This is this is the thing that is given that can give you the adiabatic cell. Then we have the resonances. This is what I said 20 years ago. We started something with Apostolatos and Godopoulos, and still. I'm on the same page, studying the same thing, what happens with resonances. And then you have the post-adiabatic order, and this is where spin enters. And it is the linear and spin approximation that I care about. And I have to have accurate enough measurements, which have also the deformation of the body, the secondary body, the a stellar black hole or a neutron star that is deforming the space time itself. I have to introduce here there is a second order cell force, dissipative average force that enters here. There are different terms in this phase, and we have to have all of them in order to get a correct answer. Maybe the detection can be done by, uh, by, the, by the term just here. But if you want to know the spin of the secondary, the spin of the primary, and all the parameters correctly, the current consensus is that I have to go up to here. And this is where we are entering the whole discussion. So what, what is accurate enough? And I will, so there is the mass ratio. All the expansion is done in the terms of the mass ratio. And we see that the spin, the measure of the spin, is actually of the order of the mass ratio. So uh, it should be if the mass ratio of, of the extreme mass ratio is parallel around 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 6. This is essential when I show you the next slide. Because here, basically, we have used huge quantities. We use different spin sample and the condition. You can see the crosses, the circles, and the spin is not of the order of 10 to minus 4, it's of order of 10, 10, to, uh, to, 10 to 0, basically. It's of unity. So I've exaggerated the value of it in order to see any discrepancy. And what we have seen using different spin sample and condition and computed the fluxes, flux is the rate by which uh, the energy and or the underground momentum is lost. Here you see the fluxes here are of the uh, energy. And what we see is that it doesn't really play, play any role because all the way around, so 
here is here you are away from the black hole. This is basically a reparameterization of frequency. So instead of X, you can see the frequency itself. And as I approach here, I approach the black hole, the central black hole. And you can see that all the things are plus much beyond, apart from these red circles are in agreement. And this is for very exaggerated values of the spin. So from the point of view, so we have seen the, free, the orbital frequencies themselves. And we said, what we need is linear. So from the orbital point of view of circular orbits, at least, we don't see any problem. At the point of view of fluxes, the answer, the indication is the same. The shift in the center of the mass should not play any role. So the takeaway message from the wall of talk is in curved space times, the changing the center of mass is not the trivial thing. And it can introduce in your modeling some inaccuracies from the theoretical point of view. Are, there, are these inaccuracies something that can impact your uh, measurements by Lisa? No, this is plus minus the wall summary of the wall thing. Yeah. Thank you, Georgos, very much. Very interesting things. Maybe we can start the discussion here. Uh, questions from the audience <laughs> or from people that are following online. Online. Um, probably... I don't think people are following online because the big date I realized is when uh, uh, this is a Lisa symposium in Dublin. So all the people interested in Lisa and science are now in Dublin and they have a hybrid uh, form of conference. So probably more everybody will be tuned with the Lisa okay. symposium. Uh... I don't see any, uh, wait, we have to check it here, go down. Oops. Here, somewhere, we should have the view of all participants. Now that we can see the participants, that yeah, but they don't have no okay. One can raise the hand, but it is the other option that we have here. And uh, okay, I don't think that if one and uh, we can, can, can just speak. speak because, yeah, exactly, because I don't see raised hands. And okay, so I hope you can also hear him here. Yeah, and just, I think <laughs> complicated. Uh, Yanis, uh, team is Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, not in the same place, but uh, today they are not uh, here. Yanis is in, uh, in France. Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much again then. <laughs> so the discussion. Yeah, uh, will be of the record. record for other topics, I think more directed to the Schiavicabet or the Institute of Dynamity, resonances, 